Welcome, everybody, to our finance and investment session. Um, I think we're going to hit on a lot of topics, um, but maybe maybe kick off with, with introductions, starting with, uh, with Peter at the far end, um, Managing Director at Digital Bridge and co-head of the Strategic Asset Fund. Um, maybe a couple of words about your activities, and then we'll hand it over to Kristen and then to Ariana. Sure. Thanks, John, and great to be here. Um, so I'm a managing director with Digital Bridge and co-head of our strategic asset fund, which is sort of a core plus strategy. Uh, again, all digital infrastructure, that's all we do, as Mark Ganzi uh, said earlier, if you guys were here for his talk. Um, so we look at uh, buying very um, sort of long-term tenored cash flows around data centers, cell towers, our, two init our three initial investments, uh, two large tower portfolios in Europe, uh, in Belgium and Germany, and then a, a set of... Uh, hyperscale stabilized data centers in, um, in Europe as well. So I spend my time looking for assets like that, also assisting on our growth strategies uh, in investments like the switch acquisition, for example. So pleased to be here. Kristen. Yeah, hi, I'm Kristen O'Connor Leung. I'm a managing director at GIC, which is one of Singapore's sovereign wealth funds. I'm a part of the real estate group, so our investment mandate um, spans all real estate sectors of which data centers happens to fall into for us. Um, so I oversee our data center investing globally, as well as um, I head up our, our private equity funds program. So within our data center portfolio, we have um, several, or I guess I can now say many, um, direct and joint venture relationships globally, as well as some indirect um, fund investments as well, the majority of which has been historically uh, hyperscale development focused, but we've diversified more recently into more network dense and interconnected platforms as well. Ariana, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. My name is Ariana Batori. I work for the International Finance Corporation. I'm the global lead for broadband investments. Uh, the IFC is part of the World Bank Group, and it's a development finance institution. Uh, we essentially support uh, businesses across emerging markets. I focus exclusively on the telecom sector, have been doing this for 13 years. Um, every year, our investment uh, volume is about 24 billion. And out of that, uh, about a billion, up to a billion and a half, tends to be telecom investments. And in terms of asset classes, most of what was mentioned uh, uh, here, uh, the traditional, what we call foundational infrastructure, data centers, fiber, tower. And then we are actually focusing these days a lot more on kind of cloud-enabled services, X as a service, and, and other types of add-ons. Um, and then maybe talk a little bit about geographic preference uh, types of economies that you uh, invest in. Is it seed investment? Is it lending? Sure. Um, yes. In, in terms of geographies, uh, we are a global institution. We have over 100 offices. And um, the only limitation we have is that we focus on the what we call emerging markets. So not so much on North America, Western Europe, developed Asia. Um, in terms of products, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do equity, debt, mezzanine, uh, technically anything that a, an operator may, may need in terms of, of capital, we can do. And we also have a broad range of advisory services. Um, and then, Kristen, maybe by way of further introduction, um, um, in, involved in real estate, um, um, what else kind of falls on your radar screen when you're thinking about data centers uh, versus other, other asset classes? You don't do fiber, you don't do towers, but you're kind of more traditional real estate. Tell us a little bit about the um, activities you have and, and maybe the, the lens through which you look at a data center investment that you're underwriting versus um, other assets, industrials and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's right. We have a pretty broad mandate within real estate. Um, we invest in what's known as all of the kind of traditional real estate sectors, hospitality, office, retail, multifamily, and industrial. Um, but I'd say over 50% of our portfolio, at least in the Americas, is in what we call more niche real estate sectors. So that would that's data centers falls into that category, as well as um, student housing, self-storage, single family for rent. We've really, over the past six years, kind of oriented our portfolio away from the traditional real estate asset classes. Um, and within those, we primarily 
are focused on expanding our multifamily for rent apartment business and industrial business. Um, and to a lesser extent, if we had to invest in resale, I'd say more like neighborhood shopping center business versus the enclosed malls. Um, office, I think as everyone here is probably aware, is, is pretty challenging. Um, currently, um, from a financing standpoint, and just also on a go-forward basis in terms of what exactly happens with all those office towers, um, especially in San Francisco, we're on base. So in addition to kind of having that sector diversity, we also have um, a pretty large credit book as well that we do within real estate via three or four platforms that we've set up. So we can invest across the capital structure as well. So oftentimes, for example, um, there might be a, a data center deal that we don't participate um, on the equity, equity side in terms of the M&A transaction, but we do then kind of circle back and take a piece on, on the debt side as well. Um, and then still with, with you, Kristen, but in, in, in industrials, there, there are certain adjacencies between those and, and, and data centers, and um, how do you kind of compare the different um, investment um, merits with, like, say, logistics and industrials versus full turnkey data center assets? Yeah, I'd say the industrial logistics assets are just much more simpler and more akin to a, to a powered shell versus kind of the, the full turnkey data center development. So therefore, um, they have a much higher cost of capital, uh, not a much higher cost of capital, but I'd say you know 100 to 200 basis points spread cost of capital for us versus just the plain industrial assets. Um, both have become a lot more expensive over the past three years. So um, we have found it harder and harder to um, acquire those assets. They often both trade above replacement costs, which for real estate is kind of our North Star of how we think about valuations. So that has oriented us in, in both cases to kind of do uh, more development versus acquisitions. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit uh, to, to, to mobile infrastructure, starting with uh, Peter and, and then Ariana, and, and maybe uh, comment a little bit on the, um, the CapEx trends that you're seeing about the carriers around 5G. How does that uh, affect your investment allocation decisions? Where do you see the greatest opportunities? There's uh, small cells, there's fiber uh, that, uh, that supports mobile infrastructure. There's towers themselves, ground-based towers, rooftops. Um, how do you see the landscape? Any any interesting opportunities that you see in particular geographies or, or subsectors? We're, um, as Mark shared earlier, global tower owners. Um, and what we're seeing is very robust uh, trends on CapEx spend when the carriers. 5G rollouts are, um, are happening. They're happening faster in certain parts of the world than others. Um, but that, you know, that does inform sort of investment decisions around, you know, where, where haven't they happened in a big way yet? And because they will. You know, the movie that plays out in North America in telecom over and over again tends to play out around the rest of the world. I think hyperscale data center is a great example of that, right? You know, you saw the hyperscalers really just become massive um, customers of, of data center capacity in North America, and then that trend rolled out into Europe. Again, they had to go where the eyeballs are. The eyeballs, you know, the heat map of the world, right, at night, where are the lights? The lights are eyeballs, eyeballs consume content, the hyperscalers need to be, you know, adjacent to those markets. So, you know, the thesis on Scala was the hyperscalers have to go to South America. There are a lot of eyeballs down there. Companies in South America are going to want to use Office 365. It's just, you know, it's going to happen, and it is happening. So, therefore, they need the plumbing and the infrastructure to serve those customers. That creates demand. So, on, on towers, you know, we think about it the same way. The carriers in certain parts of Asia, maybe less developed Asia, haven't, begun in a big way the 5G rollout yet, but, but they will. Um, and, you know, we're there with, with towers to, to serve them. Ariana. It's, my reality is a bit different. Um, yeah. I very much agree with what you said um, in terms of activity in developed markets. Just simply because I focused on, on emerging markets, there's very few where we have, say, at scale 5G rollouts. Um, and I think um, emerging markets are also looking, as you said, at the US market, Korea, uh, Europe, to see kind of what happened there. And um, while, say, Korea was a, a more successful case compared to the others, in Europe, you know, it's 5G coverage is, what, 70% almost, and the percentage of, of 5G connections is still low single digits, right? Um, 
Our, one of our main theses on the acquisition of the Deutsche Telekom Towers is they were very, um, very open about their, their need to build out the 5G network covering Germany. And Vertical Bridge, our North American tower company, had played a major role in building out T-Mobile's 5G network in the US, which has been very successful for them. And one of the reasons um, Deutsche Telekom selected us as the winner of that sale process was the partnership that we had with them in North America. They had the confidence in us as a partner to help them do that same thing in Germany. So I, I think we'll see it, you know, just our belief is we'll see those, those CapEx spends pick up in places like Europe as, as they try and get more 5G deployed. Yeah, and the other thing related to CapEx uh, for 5G is that not all of it will be done by the carriers and even by tower companies. Um, of course, everyone is betting on industrial uses of 5G and private networks are starting to be built. It's not always that the, the carriers have a role in that. Sometimes they get contracted to build, install, operate. Sometimes they don't. So from our perspective, I think what we'll end up doing as a strategy is basically follow the industry. So if it's different parties implementing that CapEx, we'll probably try to fund them at the end of the day. Um, so Ariana, the, the IFC has a lot of experience uh, in, in towers, um, in, 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 you know, across, across Africa, and, and um, you've looked at, at investments in a lot of other emerging markets. What do you look for in terms of the the structure of the sector around how many MNOs there are, ARPU levels? Uh, there, there's wide variance across the emerging markets, and, and some might be riskier than others. How do you kind of sift through all that? Definitely, there's there's regional uh, regional variances and uh, I think things are changing though. So for example, operators in Africa have for the longest time, they've had no choice but to deal with the power issue and many of them without intending to become one, they've become some sort of logistics uh, company for hauling diesel tanks left and right in some countries, right? It's not the business that they wanted to be in but they had no choice. Uh, in Latin America, for the longest time, the tower business was very simple, right? The real estate play, I put up the steel structure, leave me alone. <laughs> I don't, they don't care about the rest. Now it's changing. Uh, the latest, uh, all of the latest events in, in Latin America, um, the power track is there. Everybody talks about energy services for towers. Everybody talks about sustainability. Uh, and then, of course, the industry goes a bit a step further and expanding into fiber. Many, many tower companies now present themselves as a digital infrastructure platform. So I think the business model of tower codes is changing. And as a result, our kind of underwriting criteria has to change with it. Um, so it's another big debate you, you probably also see out there in the, in the industry is, is it beneficial or not for a tower company to try to do all these other things, or should they stick to the core business, which you know, may attract higher margins, or maybe um, you know, uh, trade at higher multiples, et cetera. So across the regions, I think we really take it uh, kind of case by case basis. Definitely uh, some criteria applies across the board in terms of number of operators, of course. Um, hopefully, or ideally, we have at least two, three of them that are good off takers. And then in addition to the big carriers, an ecosystem of supporting uh, uh, like uh, smaller players, maybe internet service providers or other people that may be able to, to use the towers. Um, so I, I am getting the audience a chance to ask questions. So if you do have any, um, raise your hand or, or make yourself visible. And I'm going to go through a couple of more, but uh, you might want to think about questions for, for, for the panel. Um, maybe, maybe just one more um, um, kind of sidebar on, on mobile uh, or, or wireless, and that would be satellites. Um, and to what extent, uh, I guess, Peter and Ariana, have you looked at those or, or exp experience that you have in, yeah, in those sectors? Yeah, we've, we've looked. We don't have any, uh, any satellite investments. We've looked at a bunch of the different models. Um, and just don't, I don't think we consider ourselves sort of expert enough on, on those models to really want to take the plunge in a big way. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of capacity has been, has been, you know, announced and launched. And, you know, I think we probably worry at a high level a little bit about, you know, what that could mean for pricing. Um, you know, the um, GoGo, uh, the GoGo business that primarily serves, you know, aircraft. Um, was uh, an asset that um, was sort of in play a little bit, which we spent some time looking at. But we were very concerned about the uh, the Elon Musk um, 
platform and what that could do to pricing, quite frankly, on, you know, on the, the GoGo service. So you, know, you just have to sort of understand like, where you are in the maturation of that, of that market and uh, not sort of enter at the wrong time when you could step into declining pricing and margin, margin compression. On our end, we've done one in the, in the past, and we are looking. Um, I, I fully share your view. We're also kind of try to be cautious and understand the different different business models. I think the promise is there. Technology has evolved a lot. Uh, the costs have gone down. There's more alternatives to launch the satellites. There's you know the, it's really helping us kind of reduce the capex uh, cost, and then. From a um, priority for us as a development bank, I personally have some hope for the direct-to-mobile uh, promise of the satellite technology. Um, Peter, Peter, you said taking the Peter, you said taking the plunge, so maybe think about subsea cable um, naturally. So that would be maybe the last uh, <laughs> yeah. leg to talk about in terms of connectivity. Yeah. And again, for Ariana and for and for yourself. Any yeah, I think that's sort of another sector that we spend a lot of time looking at, and at some point, I suspect we'll have some subsea investments, but. I think the concerns are similar. You know, if you think about the subsea business, the the people using the most capacity on the subsea cables are, you know, sort of these names we always talk about, the hyperscalers or the metas, people like that. You know, they are the largest customers of a lot of the cables that are already out there, and they're building their own now. So your largest customers are sort of self-fulfilling going forward. And we think that because, you know, it's very negative sort of long term for some of the existing assets. Um, now, if you can partner with them on building you know, the next cable they're building, um, that, that feels like a pretty attractive opportunity because you've got you know, sort of an in-place anchor tenant, if you will, not unlike doing sort of a hyperscale data center development where you've got the, the building pre-lease to one of, the, one of the hyperscalers. But otherwise, you know, I think we're somewhat um, cautious on the subsea sector. On, on our end, we have... Um we have done both equity and debt for uh, subsea cables, um, many of them around the African continent, one from Brazil to the US, and one in Asia. Um, I think uh, it hasn't been a darling of private equity in particular, because although it's literally in the water, it's not a liquid asset. <laughs> <laughs> So it's the most liquid it could be, but it's, there, is not, yeah. there isn't a market, right? People don't buy and sell cables all of the time. It happens that it, they change hands, but yeah. it's not the given. Or capacity on cables sometimes changes hands, waves, things like that. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> we can make a lot of jokes. Yes, we can. <laughs> yeah, right. All of which will be bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned hyperscale, and, and I think somebody said cloud. So Kristen, maybe to give you a, a chance to kind of opine, cloud capex uh, still very robust. I think uh, I'm sorry, cloud revenue growth is still very robust, double digit billions a year. Um, it is starting to taper off, so I think the second derivative might be negative now, even though it's grown in the absolute. Um, how do you view implications for the growth of your data center platforms, as well as maybe the, the M&A landscape within data centers? Yeah, I mean, for, for our platforms specifically, that um, negative second derivative definitely sent a lot of emails to my inbox from internal counter parties, but um, that definitely were concerned about the overall slowing of the p potential slowing of demand. Um, however, I'd say what we've seen in our portfolio is, is anything but um, if you have power availability and um, go-to-market availability for kind of the next 12 months. We've seen very, very strong leasing and demand. And I don't think it kind of is a um, trees grow to the sky situation. I think historically there has been t periods of time where the hyperscalers take a lot of space and then kind of have to digest it and start utilizing it. So maybe you, know, you have a, a year or 18 months where it slows down, but we haven't seen really any change in, in that um, demand and leasing it still is pretty strong and I'd say actually um, pricing has gotten a little bit better as well. Um, not in every case, I think um, we'd all love to paint a picture that you know all the rising costs and are being absorbed by you know the customer and that yields are unchanged. I think there has been pressure on yields 
There's still a fairly attractive spread, though, to where we think cap rates are, if, and I say think because we're not actually 100% sure these days, but it's still an attractive business that's, that's doing pretty well for us. Um, I'd say like with the tenant negotiations, there seems to be kind of a three-prong trade-off between, um, and you know, we look at this from a real estate lens, right? So it's, it's length of contract, it's the inflationary or contractual bumps, and then it's, it's the starting run, and it's a little bit of a dance between the three. Like you could definitely, from my seat, I'd love to have them all, but that, that definitely is not happening. Yeah, I'd really echo that. We're seeing um, certainly you know, pay attention to the you know, quarterly announcements from the, the cloud providers that their growth is slowing. But I think when you step back, okay, we're not growing at 35% anymore, we're growing at 20-something you know, percent. If you look at the absolute dollars of revenue growth that represents, it's still billions of dollars a year of incremental revenue that, that requires a lot more data center capacity, right? I mean, you know, uh, somebody, uh, this is something I borrowed from somebody, I forget who it was, but you know, if the cloud grows, we need more sky to put it in. And the cloud's still growing, even might, might be growing more slowly, but it's still growing at a pretty healthy rate. So leasing in our um, hyperscale focused platforms, Vantage and Scala in particular, is, um, is up significantly uh, over the last 12 months, and the pipelines remain incredibly deep. So we're not seeing, you know, we're, we're cautious because we're, you know, we're not, um, you know, blind to sort of the macro thing we're seeing, but so far it's not showing up in demand at the portfolio company level. And then um, Ariana, in, in, in emerging markets, um, cloud exists. Maybe it's at a different stage of growth. Um, it might be slightly different logos in, say, Southeast Asia versus Latin America. But any sort of comments on um, data center demand drivers and, and kind of the investment opportunities? I mean, uh, across emerging markets, it's a, it's a bit of the same story. Hyperscalers continue to drive the demand. I'm very happy to see that they continue to expand their regions and availability zones. Um, the map uh, gets nicer every year. So that definitely brings on a lot of opportunities, including in the fiber space, because once the data center is there, you need to connect it to the undersea cable, you need to have a metro ring, you need to do a lot of things. So it's, it's uh, still generating a lot of build. And then we have the enterprise sector, which of course is significantly riskier and a whole different proposition to try to build a business plan only around that. Um, but, I mean, most companies came out of the pandemic a bit more digitally enabled than they were before. Uh, so the hope is, of course, that as we all change our behaviors, corporations also now do more things online and they, there's a different way to offer their services and everything is cloud-based. Uh, so some Cautious hope here for, for the growth of the enterprise segment as well. Um, seeing no questions, if there are any, uh, yeah, There's there is two. a couple in the back. Um, Hello, um, my name's Heather Hudson. Um, my question's for Ariana. Are there any investments by IFC in the Pacific Islands region or Pacific Basin, either domestic or regional, or are they only eligible for more concessionary World Bank funds? And what criteria would you use for the smaller island nations? Uh, and do they partner with private sector investors as well as IFC? Thank you for the question, uh, definitely. So IFC, although we're part of the World Bank Group and our shareholders are 200 governments, we focus exclusively on private sector companies. So we are actually not able to finance telecom operators where the government is a majority shareholder. Uh, that being said, um, whether a country is eligible or not for IFC financing <coughs> depends pretty much on the income level. So there's a classification and countries graduate, you know, the richer they get, basically, the less uh, we are able to help them because the assumption is uh, they are able to attract enough private uh, capital, investment banks, uh, local banks, uh, they're able to fill that funding gap. But that being said, uh, yes, we, we do a lot of business in Asia, we have our hub in Singapore, we have people all over, um, and we have done, let me think of island nation 
projects. I think the latest would be an undersea cable we've done linking the Maldives. I'd be happy to talk to you about that after the session. Or, or, or perhaps pay a visit uh, at some point. <laughs> yeah. um, so so um, we're getting down to uh, under, under five minutes. I wanted to ask, uh, really, maybe starting with Peter and Kristen, and you can feel free to chime in, Ariana, if you'd like, but with the um, financing costs have, having gone so much higher over the last uh, six plus months, um, and the fact that uh, both you and, and GIC are often co-investors, uh, sometimes you own the majority, sometimes you're, you're, you're a minority, but a lot of folks have to, a lot of capital has to come together from multiple sources. Um, what, what, how do you characterize the fundraising environment? Um, is there as much appetite given that it's tougher to see return hurdles? Um, it's, uh, it's yeah. gotten more challenging for sure, John, and certainly on the debt side um, with the rise in, in rates um, and spreads widening. Given all the volatility, you know, debt capital is a lot more expensive, and that has a real impact on your underwriting models. Um, and you know, we believe that we are seeing that begin to show up in, in prices. We think cap rates for sort of the best assets have, have risen a bit. It's very situational. Um, you know, if it's a market where um, certain key players are under underinvested, you can have very um, very robust auctions. Uh, there was some assets recently in South America that were were sold for a great, great price. Um, but there are other assets that in other parts of the world that have um, definitely fetched, I think, a little bit less than what folks were expecting. Um, and, and look, I, th I think we feel like as volatility sort of drops and spreads come in, you'll see cap. And you know, when I'm, what am I talking about drop? You know, 100 basis points of cap rate, maybe? You know, if, if trades were happening in the mid fours, maybe those are happening in the mid fives now. Um, but I, you know, I think our belief over time is those, for the best assets, those cap rates will come back in, quite frankly. So that was a comment on uh, valuation and then, and then maybe just um, fundraising, Kristen. Kristen, how do, you, how do you kind of see that among some of your peers, uh, the appetite to actually put money into digital assets? Uh, we, we definitely have the appetite to put it into additional assets, but just not at what I'll say is like yesterday's pricing. So I think there, it's been, hard for us to execute kind of um, M&A deals over the last six months. We've looked at a lot of the processes. A lot of the processes are actually still going because I think there has been, outside of kind of the one that you mentioned, there's been a bit of a, there is that disconnect between where um, buyers want to transact and sellers are willing to transact. So we've just seen that process get elongated. Um, and it's not only the financing costs on the entry, which for us needs to be accretive day one, it's also kind of thinking about um, how are we pricing the exit if we're kind of not necessarily, go I don't think anyone thinks we're going back to that extended period of just lower interest rates. It's kind of a, a real change in, in how we're thinking about um, pricing things. And, and we don't fundraise, you know, but we're willing to invest. But in the US, we are limited to only being 49% um, of any one investment, just given we have a tax um, set up that that's the most efficient way for us to invest and I will say that for the past nine months or so it's been much harder than it has been in the past decade to find that other 49 percent to to invest alongside with us I, I think we're still seeing lots of appetite John but to Kristen's points you know the, the bar is is a bit higher than it might have been you know eight months a year ago um, but I also think it's very dependent on the type of asset you're talking about is it a a growth asset that's still doing a lot of development where you know the growth of that asset can can overcome um, some of the uh, the valuation challenges or exit assumption challenges because you can just have enough organic growth versus a stabilized asset where the you know the die is cast so to speak you know you've got a long term lease with probably a very good credit there may be some annual escalators but there aren't a lot of levers to pull to create incremental value the the stage is kind of set and it's all about your entry you know your entry price your financing costs and then what your exit assumption is so. It's a little dependent on um, what type of asset you're looking at. That was the last word. We are out of time. I want to thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.